It's March, 1898. Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson has just arrived in Kenya on a train from the port of Mombasa. He's been dispatched to this location by the Foreign Office of the Uganda Railway to oversee the construction of a bridge across the Savo River. This is something that Patterson has looked forward to his entire life. He's always dreamed of visiting Africa. He revels in the beauty of the African landscape, an extensive wilderness covered by low stunted trees and a jungle of thick undergrowth and thorns. The snow-capped peak of Mount Kilimanjaro, a stunning backdrop for a breathtaking scene. Not far from the main railway camp, comprised of some 3,000 workmen, Patterson makes camp and settles into his temporary home. Within days of his arrival, he receives all the necessary labor and supplies to complete his task, and he begins work on the bridge straight away. As the sun sets over the savannah one night in his third week in country, the colonel settles into his quarters for the evening. He has no idea that this night is different from any other. This night would change everything and mark the beginning of one of the most incredible historic accounts of man versus beast that the world has ever known. As darkness falls upon the Savo, the workmen hunkered down for the evening. A full moon dimly lights the usually pitch dark landscape. Many of the laborers allow their campfires to burn out as the moon's soft glow provides sufficient light. In a tent on the edge of the main work camp, Ungun Singh, an Indian Jemadar, lay asleep among his bunkmates. It's a pleasantly mild evening, and the men decide to sleep with their tent doors open to enjoy the cool night air. The notion that this could be potentially dangerous never enters their minds. But just after midnight, an intruder stalks the tall grass outside the tent under the cover of darkness. Without a campfire burning, the assailant easily makes its way unnoticed across the campsite to the open tent flap. With the laborers fast asleep, it pokes its head in through the opening and wraps its massive jaws around the neck of Ungun Singh. He manages one shrill scream of terror, alerting his bunkmates to what's happening before the beast rips him from the safety of his quarters and makes off with his body through the tall grass. The other men lay in terror as they listen to the sound of their friend being devoured just yards away. The next morning, the men bring word to Lieutenant Colonel Patterson regarding the night's events. He wastes no time in arming himself and making off into the bush to track his lost workmen. Upon investigating the campsite, it quickly becomes evident that the man must have been carried off by a lion. The sand outside of the tent is littered with pug marks. The lion's trail is blatantly obvious and easy to track, as it must have stopped several times, leaving large pools of blood along the route and painting a long crimson line through the tall grass. Then, off in the distance, Patterson sees a telltale sign. A flock of vultures take flight from a lonely tree, alerting to the presence of the lost laborer's remains. Scattered beneath the tree, Patterson finds bits of flesh and bone. Separate from what little remains are left behind, the head of Ungun Singh lay still intact, eyes wide, a gnarled expression of horror on his face. Patterson describes the grisly scene as the most gruesome sight he'd ever seen. Upon close examination, it's determined that not one, but two lions are responsible for the brutal attack. On taking a roll call, it's discovered that several other workers have evidently disappeared, unreported, in the previous days. But Ungun Singh would become the first officially recognized victim of the two lions that would become known as the Savo Maneaters, the Ghost and the Darkness. The night following the loss of Ungun Singh, Colonel Patterson, armed with a 303 and a 12-gauge shotgun, climbs a tree and posts up on a high branch overlooking the late Jemadar's tent. Here he waits with the hope of ambushing the predators in the event that they return to claim another victim. To Patterson's amazement, indeed, the lions do strike again, but not where he expects. The night silence is abruptly pierced by the panicked cries of terrified railroad workers in a camp about a half a mile away. He clearly hears their pleas for help all the way at his perch and knows by the sounds of the desperate screams that another man must have fallen victim to the predators. The next morning, his fears are confirmed. One of the lions has invaded another tent, snatching and making off with a sleeping coolie. The night after, Patterson again climbs a tree in an attempt to dispatch the man-eaters, this time near the most recent attack, tying a goat out nearby as a lure. Again his hopes are dashed when he hears shrieks coming from a distant camp. The lions have eluded him a second time, as though they've anticipated his move. 
Eliminating these beasts will be a much more difficult task than the colonel expected. The work camps are scattered and arranged in such a way that many are miles apart. The lions could attack at any one of them over an eight-mile range, and they seem to possess the extraordinary foresight never to strike the same place twice. However, Patterson doesn't give up. Rather, he doubles his efforts. He dedicates all of his spare time to tracking and hunting the killers. By night, he posts up in hopes of intercepting the cats on their way for a potential meal, and by day he tracks their movements in hopes of finding their den. As the days pass, however, Patterson begins to realize just how incredibly clever these particular lions are. Eerily, they always seem to be a step ahead of the hunter. Whenever Patterson thinks he's pinned down where they'll strike next, they almost instinctively appear elsewhere, and when he believes he's finally tracked them within reach of their lair, he loses the trail as the lions divert through rockier terrain, as though they know better than to leave their tracks behind. Late one night, Colonel Patterson is awakened by a noise outside of his own tent. When he gets up to investigate, he finds nothing. The next morning, however, he's shocked to find the unmistakable prints of a large lion all around his camp. He immediately sets to relocating his quarters. He and the newly appointed medical officer, Dr. Brock, build a sturdy palm hut which they fortify with a thick, high boma, a sort of makeshift fence made of thorns that's common in the African bush. In addition, each night within the compound, they keep a large campfire burning to dissuade the predators from entering. The railway workers take heed and construct bomas of their own around each of the work camps. Unfortunately, the assaults continue. The cats search for weaknesses along the barrier's perimeter low spots along the fence line or areas where the thorn bushes aren't woven tightly enough. They always find a way to either jump over or break through the bomas, and workers continue to disappear regularly. By mid-April, the main railhead workmen have moved further down the line. The laborers are relieved to be leaving this place behind. But not everyone is leaving. The bridge across the Savo River is still far from complete, and there's still much work to be done. A contingent of a few hundred workmen remained to complete the project, along with the main hospital camp. The hospital camp is set apart from most of the other work camps, but has been well protected by a particularly thick and well-constructed boma. The barricade, however, proves to be no match for the cunning of the demons, as they're now commonly referred to as. It's not long before the man-eaters manage to break through and continue their reign of terror. After a failed attempt to snatch the hospital assistant, who narrowly escapes. One of the lions springs through a hospital tent housing eight patients. In the chaos, the tent is collapsed, and two of the patients are badly wounded by the lion's pounce. The brute manages to seize another patient and drags his body through the thorn barrier before consuming him not far from the camp. The morning following the lion's assault on the hospital, a new site for the hospital camp is prepared closer to the main work camps. The new camp is much more heavily fortified by a sturdier, tighter woven boma. The construction is completed and the patients moved over within the day. Colonel Patterson proceeds to set up camp for the night within the abandoned hospital's fence with the understanding that lions will often visit deserted campsites to scavenge. Perhaps he can finally put this entire bloody mess to bed. But just as on his previous hunts, the lions defy conventional lion behavior. They instead attack the newly established hospital. They again leap over the boma and take the hospital water carrier from his tent as he lays sleeping. The man fights with every ounce of strength that he has, clinging to any solid object within reach in an attempt to thwart the lion's attack. But once the big cat succeeds in dragging the water carrier into the open, it inflicts a lethal bite to his throat before picking its victim up in its jaws like a rag doll and plunging into the barbed wall leaving bits of torn clothing and flesh among the thorny entanglement. What little is left of the water carriers recovered the next day, just 400 yards from the hospital. It's decided that the hospital should be relocated once more, and the boma built even higher and thicker. Again, the work is completed and patients moved by the end of the day. This time, once the construction is finished, Patterson arranges for a covered wagon to be placed outside the newly abandoned hospital site. Within its boma, several tents are left standing, and livestock are brought in as bait. The colonel and Dr. Brock resolve to have dinner at their hut before heading back to the wagon where they'll sit up all night and watch the site for the returning predators. There's no moonlight on this particular night, and the men, 
though they face the abandoned boma, can't see it at all. The two sit in what Patterson describes as a deadly, oppressive silence, listening for the sound of movement to alert them to the presence of the beasts. After some time, the sound of a dry twig snapping breaks the silence. It's quickly followed by a dull thud the men assume must be a lion jumping over the boma. Indeed, they can hear the uneasy movements of the cattle within the fence, suggesting a predator is near. Lieutenant Colonel Patterson makes a move to exit the wagon to position himself for a possible shot, but is promptly stopped by the doctor. They'd only heard what sounded like a single lion. The other could be anywhere. And just then, out of the corner of his eye, Patterson thinks he sees movement in the darkness. It seems to be stalking the tall grass, moving directly towards the wagon. He almost shrugs it off as perhaps his eyes playing tricks on him, due to the prolonged strain appearing into the pitch dark. But then, all of a sudden, an immense shape materializes from the darkness and leaps straight towards the open flap of the tent. The lion, Patterson shouts as both men fire their weapons simultaneously, foiling the impending attack. One of the lions had been stalking the wagon the entire time the other seemingly used as a diversion. Upon investigating the area outside the makeshift blind, the two find no sign that the lion had been hit by either shot. One bullet is found embedded in the ground within inches of the lion's print. Both parties, it appears, have narrowly escaped their demise, and so concludes Patterson's first direct encounter with the man-eaters. <laughs>